But the Royal Air Force, as we know it today, didn't actually form immediately. On the 28th of February 1911, the Army pipped the Navy to the post with the formation of the Air Battalion of the Royal Engineers, which comprised of two units flying aeroplanes and airships. In the meantime, the Admiralty, not wishing to be outdone, rapidly established a school of flying and set up six airship sites in Scotland and along the east coast of England. Now these early steps really helped to stir up an intense interest in all things aeronautical. So much so, in fact, that by 1912, it had become clear that what was really needed was some sort of national air service or flying corps. On the 13th of April, 1912, a royal warrant was issued by His Majesty, King George V, and the new air service was christened the Royal Flying Corps. Its motto was per ardua ad astra, which although not strictly translatable, basically means through adversity to the stars, and it remains unique to the Royal Air Force today. But back in 1912, despite the inspirational motto, the new RFC had barely four aircraft at its disposal, and early attempts at setting down new regulations were blocked. The RFC was not as unified as it seemed. For a start, it still had two separate wings, Army and Navy, that were administered by the War Office and the Admiralty, respectively. The Royal Navy, as the senior service, strongly resisted any suggestion of amalgamating these two separate wings into one. And in June 1914, the Admiralty removed the Naval Wing from the control of the Royal Flying Corps and renamed it the Royal Naval Air Service on the 1st of July. It had taken just under 10 years from the Wright's 1903 flight to the formation of the Royal Flying Corps. And by then, it was clear that military aviation was here to stay. From modest beginnings, the remaining army wing of the RFC began to grow rapidly. In May 1912, number one airship and kite squadron was formed flying a combination of dirigible airships, balloons and kites. Other squadrons were soon formed, some flying a mixture of the new monoplanes and biplanes. The new aeroplane, however, was soon to be put to the test in a real battle situation. On the 4th of August 1914, the Great War broke out. World War I would prove to be the first time that the new technological breakthrough of the aeroplane was used in conflict. From the mud and carnage of the airfields of northern France, the modern Royal Air Force would be born. In June and July 1917, Britain suffered its first air raids by German airships known as Zeppelins. Aerial attacks like this were something new and caused great alarm. The raids also highlighted the fact that the RFC didn't have sufficient resources to divide itself between defending Britain and continuing campaigns in France. Air defence and how best to do it quickly became a hotly debated topic. This is General Jan Smuts a highly respected South African soldier and statesman. Smuts had been brought in by the British government to assess the situation. He decided that what the RFC needed was just one body to run it. He advocated the establishment of a separate air ministry. The British government quickly acted upon Smuts' recommendations and the foundation of the Royal Air Force took place on the 1st of April 1918. So who would command this new Royal Air Force? By the 11th of November 1918, the war was over. There was a new government, 
And there was also a new Secretary of State for War and Air, Winston Churchill. Churchill invited Major General Hugh Trenchard to accept the most senior post in the new service, that of Chief of the Air Staff, a post he accepted on the 15th of February 1919. Trenchard had been an army officer, but had trained as a pilot and joined the RFC in 1913. He was quite a forceful character, but was highly respected by his men. Known as Boom by his colleagues, on account of his trademark foghorn voice, Sir John Slessor, a Second World War bomber group commander, wrote, What a character he is, the enormous lanky figure, the absent-minded manner, shot with sudden flashes of shrewd and humorous insight, the unintelligible handwriting, the inarticulate speech, always a lap or two behind his racing brain, his wonderful capacity for getting people's names mixed up. Boom was a constant source of joy to those who were lucky enough to serve under him. Trenchard showed remarkable determination and drive in his ambition to develop an air force fit for the 20th century. And it is for this reason that he is now commonly regarded as the father of the Royal Air Force.